Welcome everyone. My name is Nick Hershon. I'm an assistant professor of communication here at William Patterson. And thank you for joining us for what is the final installment this semester of our Hobart Reality Check speaker series. Uh, this is part of a series sponsored by the Communication Department under the leadership of Dr. Rob Quick and the student chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. You just heard from our president, Maria Zaniga. Our goal tonight is to hear from a professional journalist who can offer insights into how the news business works and advice for student journalists like yourselves. So as usual, I'm going to begin the conversation tonight with questions for Nick, but I want you as the audience to be involved. And like Maria said, please go on Twitter, hashtag Hobart Reality Check is the name of this series. And then we'll read those questions that you have in the second half of the discussion. So please make sure that you're up there on Twitter. Thanks to Rod Holiday, who's in the back for us tonight, running our tech, and Sarah Tafik, our publicity chair, who's going to be curating the tweets for us. And now I'd like to introduce you to our guest. So Nick Miscavige is the watchdog investigative reporter for The Courier News, The Home News Tribune, and MyCentralJersey.com, three Gannett properties that are part of the USA Today network. He has received several awards to the New Jersey Press Association. And just this past summer, I had the honor of giving him one award, the recipient of the 2017 Wilson Bardo Award, the Rookie of the Year from the New Jersey chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. His reporting has led to the resignation of public officials. It's always kind of a fun thing for journalists to say. And has prompted laws to be passed throughout the New Jersey legislature. Before he was hired at the Courier News and Home News Tribune, he attended the University at Albany in New York State's capital, where he worked as the full-year intern for Gannett's Albany Bureau and hosted a weekly radio show discussing and analyzing news stories. So please join me in welcoming Nick Miscavige to William Patterson University. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, so first off, Nick, since you are our youngest person, I told you, who's come as part of this speaker series, and you graduated from college just in 2016, so you know a lot of the questions that our journalism students may have in their heads. You were in their position a few years ago in terms of what skills they need, what kind of, how to get a job, and all that. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about what you did in college to prepare yourself for a journalism career? Sure, yeah, so uh, I went to college at the University at Albany. Uh, it's a SUNY school up in uh, upstate New York in the state capital. Um, I'm from Jersey originally though, uh, South Jersey, Burlington uh, County. Uh, I went to University at Albany just because I knew I wanted to pursue journalism and being in the state of New York, it's a huge media market, uh, New York Times, uh, Wall Street Journal, Daily News. Um, and I thought I had some good opportunities up there and uh, it was pretty much in the same price range as New Jersey colleges, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, so while I was there, uh, I took as many opportunities as I possibly could. Um, I joined the radio station. I didn't get paid for that. I did that for two years. Um, I was the president of a fledgling S SPJ chapter, um, and I brought in a bunch of speakers just like this. I uh, brought in Pulitzer Prize winner Will William Kennedy uh, for like the year-end event, and uh, unfortunately that club kind of dissipated after I graduated. The people I left it to kind of let it die, which is pretty sad. But um, And then my first internship, it was supposed to be paid. I was supposed to receive a stipend once a week. But um, once I started there, on the first day of the internship, they kind of told us politely, you know, unfortunately, due to funding restrictions, we won't be able to pay you interns this year. You can either leave now if you don't want to do it, or you can stay for the experience. So I decided to stay up there. You know, I'm from Jersey. I was up in Albany for the internship. I couldn't really go home, so I stayed up there. Learned a bunch of great stuff. It was called the Legislative Gazette. Um, I wrote about political uh, happenings, uh, events, protests, um, bills that are being sponsored. I followed a lot of bills from when they were proposed uh, to picking up sponsors to eventually being passed or, uh, you know, defeated in the legislature. And then we actually hand delivered those papers to the politician's office uh, in uh, Albany, New York, in the state capitol, which was kind of like this unique experience, you know, hand deliver the paper to the guy, you know, you're, you might be reporting about. Uh, but eventually that paper, I was the last, after 45 years, I think, I was the last group of kids that was actually able to uh, write for the print edition. They killed the print and went strictly online after that. So it was a neat experience and I have that. And then after that, I was hired as the paid intern at Gannett Albany Bureau, which is like the company that owns USA Today. Uh, I wrote for their six New York newspapers from Rochester, to uh, Westchester, to Binghamton, to Poughkeepsie, Elmira, uh, and Ithaca. And uh, that was paid, and uh, that pretty much led directly to this job now in New Jersey, because uh, I work for Gannett 
it's the same company. And pretty much, you know, I went to school with, I think there's like 200 kids, 200 students in my journalism class. And I can probably think about, of, of about 10 of them that graduated and were hired in the journalism field. So it really does come down to, you know, taking as many opportunities as you can, just kind of busting your butt. I used to get made fun of a little bit, you know, staying in sometimes just to like work on, you know, like storyboard for radio and doing all like this extracurricular stuff, but it really paid off in the end. Can you speak to the SBJ chapter? Because obviously this is being sponsored tonight by an SBJ chapter. You won the award this summer from the New Jersey SBJ. So what's the value in being part of a group like ours? No, it's a, it's a really great resource. I'm actually still a member of SBJ. Um, I pay annual dues. And uh, when I was in college, we used to hold events, you know, like uh, how to request government records or uh, bringing in like journalists that, you know, were working in the field and, uh, you know, maybe switched from print to online just to give people like that discrepancy between like the two forms of uh, media. And then also, you know, like holding uh, various workshops and other stuff. So, yeah, it, it really was, it came in handy for me. And then I think also like a lot of, a lot of people that weren't really on the same experience level could really just step in at any point and kind of get up to speed. So your current job that you have, Courier News, Home News Tribune, MyCentralJersey.com, uh, you have a very interesting title there. And I think yeah. on the posters that we're using to promote this series, Watchdog Investigative Reporter, yeah, funny. Uh, it sounds really fun. So can you tell us what is the duty of a Watchdog Investigative Reporter? Yeah, so, uh, so basically a Watchdog, uh, what, you know, we're such a small paper these days that uh, I pretty much cover everything, which is kind of the neat thing about working for a small local community paper, because I really go from features to business to school stories. And then when I have extra time, I get to, you know, submit these record requests and investigate public officials or, uh, you know, like political malfeasance. That's really the main goal of the Watchdog Reporter, to be like this go-to source when it comes f to like keeping politicians in check, uh, making sure things are operating smoothly in various public boards or public utilities, um, because there's a ton of them in New Jersey. I cover four counties. I cover Somerset, Hunterdon, Middlesex, and then parts of Union County. Um, and just along with that, that's like over 200 different towns, you know, and I'm one guy. Mm. So it is, you know, sometimes it is pretty overwhelming. Uh, sometimes I got to submit a request for each one of those towns. So I'll sit down for like a week and submit 200 Oprah requests, you know, and then mm. keep track of them all. Wow. So I know you, we talked about the broad outlines of some topics we want to discuss tonight, and one of them was the importance of public records. There aren't a lot of uh, courses maybe in college where you're taught how to submit Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, can you talk about what it is to make a public records request and why you think it's an important part of journalism? Sure. So, uh, yeah, that's really one of the most important tools I rely on. And uh, pretty much anybody who's a reporter, whether in sports or uh, education, you're probably going to be requesting some sort of government record at some point. Um, I guess the law is from the 2000s, like the late uh, or early 2000s, uh, right before 2010, they passed uh, like the Sunshine Law package in New Jersey. It was like right around this renaissance of government transparency. Like we should allow members of the public to know a little bit more about what uh, their politicians are doing. Um, and each state's kind of, you know, a little bit different. And then you have like your federal freedom of information law, law or act for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's FOIA, mm -hmm. because in New York, they model it after the federal law. Uh, and when I was up there, it was a lot easier for me to request documents. We used to call them uh, fishing ex expeditions, where you could basically just like cast a net and say, I'm requesting information from here to here, like these two dates, and they'd give you everything. It's called freedom of information. It's literally in the law's writing. In New Jersey, on the other hand, it's like really restrictive. Uh, it took me a long time to kind of figure out how to request documents, because people get denied all the time. Uh, it's called Open Public Records Act, so you got to request the record. You can't request a record from this date to that date. You have to know exactly which record and when it was filed so you can like kind of get a hold of that. So it does take a lot of extra work, and uh, there's really nobody in the government's position in New Jersey that's an advocate uh, for journalists and transparency. In New York, there was a guy, his name was Robert Freeman. He was a part of uh, the Sunshine Institute up there, and he was a government employee. And basically, he was like a mediator between like a lot of the members of the public and a lot of members of the media between government entities. Like, look, you're in the wrong. You have to give them, you know, this uh, this document, or else it's going to go to court. And then when it goes to court in New Jersey, if the government tries to challenge it, uh, 
they have to pay the legal fees for whoever you know they were denying. Mm -hmm. So it usually just ends up costing more taxpayer money, and to begin with, it could have just you know given you the document. Right, right. But I, I come up with a ton of good stories just from Oprah requests. Yeah, that's the kind of work that often does win awards, and that's probably one of the reasons why you got this Bardo Award. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, so, and I want to go through uh, a bunch of the different stories that you've written, and while we go through it, I know that there's some that made use of publicly available data or freedom of information request data, so you can maybe walk us through it. So why don't we get started? We'll just look at kind of a chronology of some of the work that you've done, sure. um, and you can tell us a little bit more about these stories and how they came about. Um, so the first one that I want to put up here is from August 3rd of 2016. Um, you have it, the headline here, it's a front page story that Nick had, ex-convict running for school board seat. And this ended up being part of this series on a man named Nilesh Dasandi, an ex-con who ran for the Edison School Board. And eventually your stories prompted state legislators to pass a law, a law relating to, I guess, someone like this not being able to, to run. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly read the lead first few sentences here of the story uh, since uh, people in the audience can't see it and then maybe you can describe in a little more detail how you did this reporting. But uh, the lead from the story you see up on the screen, a township board of education candidate who served six months in federal prison for immigration fraud will likely be disqualified for the position if he is elected. Nilesh Jasandi submitted his petition to have his name on the ballot for the school board elections in November, and so did four other prospective board members. But unlike the other four, he pleaded guilty to one count of conspiracy to launder the proceeds of trafficking documents relating to legal resident status. So I know you end up doing this whole series you're very proud of. Can you tell us a little bit more about this work? Sure, yeah. So, uh, so pretty much uh, this is kind of just like old school journalism. You know, you see a candidate's name, the first thing you should do is probably look him up. Does he have any criminal convictions? Does he have any pending court cases? So I did that like immediately when I got these uh, petitions and it turned out, you know, this guy showed up uh, in, this, uh, in this database of being somebody that was convicted of a, a federal crime. And he was actually, there was a press release still on the Fed's website from when he was arrested. So then like the next thing I had to do was kind of like figure out if it was the same Nilesh Dasandi, find out where he lived and uh, his birth date so I could match up the two. And that was like, mm -hmm through some more publicly available data. Um, we have like a big database we use called LexisNexis. It's like a legal server. So I did that, I matched up the two and then I had it within probably like an hour. So I uh, typed up the story as like a breaking news story and I kind of started like this whole media uh, frenzy. Everybody else kind of had the same story like uh, progressing that same day. Um, and then, you know, from there, it's just kind of started developing into like this whole story. It was like, how is this possible? How can somebody run for school board who, uh, you know, was uh, convicted of a crime and uh, served time in prison. Um, and it turned out that the law kind of had like this weird loophole where it was, uh, if you could run if you were a convicted criminal, but depending on uh, the outcome of the election, if you were elected, uh, they would do a background check. And then depending on the results of the background check, you'd probably be kicked off the board and then somebody would have to fill in the superintendent and then a special election would be held. So it was all like this extra work and all this extra money for something that could kind of just be like nipped in the bud. You know, if this just, is don't just let them run. Yeah, if they, if they just weren't allowed to run in the first place, this wouldn't happen. And then, you know, kind of these legislators called on, I think it was uh, Kara Binchak uh, sponsored a bill and it got uh, picked up by, this was after like one year of me working in uh, full-time news. So it was kind of like surreal watching this all happen. Uh, and the story really took off from there. Uh, I've, I oprahed his, uh, his nominate, nominating petitions and I saw that uh, the school board president and another school board member after actually signed off and supported him uh, mm -hmm. for the board position. And they kind of just like, you know, we didn't really know his background. We just signed this petition. And it was mm -hmm. like, come on, you could have been signing anybody's petition. Like, how do you not know who you're signing? Right. So that kind of came from it. And all these other stories, you, you can take like any angle from this, like why why are you banning a guy from running for school board, but you might be able to run for other public positions and be a convicted criminal? So mm -hmm. there's always like, you know, the criminal justice angle and the legislative angle. And so we can run through some of the other photographs of all the other stories that were in this series as we talk about it. But one of the things I wanted to ask you about reporting on a plea agreement, uh, can you just speak to special challenges that you have there when you're reporting on plea agreements? Because I know sometimes that is not completely transparent. Uh, it's not as, easy maybe as going to the courthouse and seeing it all transpire. So what was that? Yeah, like? so, uh, so sometimes, you know, I, I've done a bunch of court stories. Uh, I live in Somerset County, I live in Somerville, so I'm like right down the street from the courthouse. So sometimes when there's like a big 
story going on where we know somebody's going to be appearing in court, we'll show up there and kind of watch it. Other times, you know, we handle uh, through like the prosecutor's office, they'll send releases out. Um, some plea deals, it really depends on what kind of, you know, what kind of crimes were committed. Sometimes it is protected, like if it's uh, something with, you know, child pornography or students, usually it's like a protected uh, agreement and it's really hard to get the terms of that. So you're really relying on the prosecutors, you know, you'll call them up, you'll talk to the PIO, the public information officer. And, you know, you, sometimes you have to like develop these relationships. I know some journalists are kind of hesitant to, uh, you know, cooperate with uh, public relations officers or uh, public officials. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they're doing a job too. And uh, they probably get bombarded with these requests. So I'm always trying to be like as pleasant as possible with these people because I get a lot of information from them. Mm. So you want to be on good terms with them um, and just always say, you know, how, how's your day going? How are you being? How, you know, how are things? So how do you develop relationship with sources then? Is there a certain technique that you've developed or is it just as simple as being, you seem like a gregarious person, easy to talk to. Is it as simple as that or are there certain skills that you've developed? Yeah, that's, that's actually like one of the main reasons why I went into journalism. I've never really had an issue like talking to strangers and just going up to people. I've always kind of been outgoing. Uh, it's kind of difficult. I've seen people that are shy. I've had reporter friends that are like on the shy side and it is kind of like difficult or you know harder for them. Uh, for me, you know, I grew up in Burlington. When I took this job in Somerville, I really had no idea anything about the area. I didn't know anything about the towns or the people. So I kind of did like my research before I went up there. I relied on some of my coworkers who gave me some tips or some contacts. And then from there, really, it's just like going out to events, talking to people, giving your phone number out, uh, connecting. And then believe it or not, there's people that have been doing this kind of stuff, going to meetings, we call them gadflies in the journalism business. They're people that just kind of like are always there. They're residents, member of the public, and they'll find you. You know, they'll find your phone number and reach out to you, and you'll develop relationships with those type of people, uh, whether it's off the record or on the record. Uh, so I rely a lot. You know, like I said, I'm one guy covering like more than 200 towns. So we really do rely a ton on uh, people just reaching out and just like dropping a tip. Mm. And uh, another thing I wanted to talk to you about with this series, I noticed you have a quote in the first story from former Governor Chris Christie, I assume, maybe not a direct quote, I don't know if you actually got to interview him, maybe a statement from an email or something, but can you speak to working with elected officials such as Chris Christie? Yeah, uh, for that story, I didn't actually speak to him. That was like a press release he had sent out. Mm -hmm. I spoke to Chris Christie one time uh, at an event where it was like he was announcing more funding or calling for more funding for a... Uh, for a rehabilitation center uh, for rehab programs throughout the state. And uh, he was kind of notorious for having like this macho persona around the press where he was a little standoffish. I asked him this question about a pipeline and uh, he didn't answer it. He just told me he doesn't answer hypothetical questions. And he was like, next question. And that was like my, that was like my five seconds with the governor. <laughs> so, uh, but no, uh, most elected officials, you know, you have to like really, when you come into the office, I come in probably around nine or 10, I make my calls like as soon as I possibly can, especially when you're dealing with elected officials or public employees, because they're usually like out of the office by 4:30. We're still there writing, and I think you know a lot of people think you know we'll send stuff out at 4:30. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a contact, you know, but they're not there after that. So you really have to like kind of plan ahead, and you nudge them sometimes. Like I'll always follow up like, the next day, like, hey, did you see this request? I'm wondering, yada yada yada. If you're not the right person to go to, just direct me to the proper person. And, uh, you know, it kind of goes from there. Sometimes it doesn't really work out that way. Sometimes you forget, you reach out to them later on. But, uh, yeah, most of the time you just have to be cordial and uh, understanding. You know, if you could put yourself in somebody else's shoes and understand where they're coming from, uh, it makes uh, both sides of the party, you know, a lot easier. So, again, since you're speaking to an audience of journalism students who maybe haven't done this sort of reporting before, if you want to get a comment from Chris Christie or Phil Murphy, the governor of New Jersey, what is your process there? Who do you contact first? How do you do it? Yeah, so uh, I actually reached out to Murphy's office uh, this morning and a few other politicians uh, for a freelance story that I'm trying to work on. Um, and basically, you know, I call, the, uh, I call the governor's office or the public official's office, and you get, you know, the secretary picks up and you ask to speak to the public information officer or, uh, you know, the, the chief of staff. And you kind of ask them, you know, I'm trying to submit some questions via email or schedule like a phone interview, uh, whichever is easier for you guys, because this one wasn't so pressing. So it was kind of like, I can, I usually prefer to do stuff over the phone or in person. But I was just like, if you're dealing with public officials, sometimes it is easier just to send an email if mm -hmm. you can't catch them in person. Uh, they usually like that stuff because they can mull it over and kind of work on the answer, give it to their staff. Right. Um, 
sometimes it makes for a better quote even, you know. Uh, but yeah, so usually you give them a little bit of a heads up or you try to schedule something in advance. Uh, say I'm trying, you know, write this story, my deadline's December 14th. Is there any availability before now and then you might be able to connect with me over the phone? So I did that with Senator Sweeney, so we'll see what happens uh, with that. Have you had situations where, I know you mentioned seeing Chris Christie in person and a press conference of a governor or a mayor. I remember trying to speak to Mayor Bloomberg when he was the mayor of New York City and that was a very difficult kind of situation, kind of unusual. But with other elected officials, have you had situations where you just show up either at their offices, sometimes even their homes or at public events that they're running and just kind of run up to them because you're on a deadline, you just don't have time to wait around for an answer? Yeah, of course. That that sort of stuff happened a lot when I was in Albany working uh, as the intern in Gannett's Albany Bureau. Um, that was actually the time where the Senate leader, Dean Skelos, and the Assembly Speaker, uh, Sheldon Silver, they were indicted and were on trial for public corruption. And they were both convicted, but I think their convictions were just overturned from a Supreme Court ruling, which is kind of like bizarre. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so they were you know, this whole thing was going on when I was like first year reporting. The state house was just like crazy, teaming with the porters all the time. We would like camp out outside of a uh, politician's office for hours on end, either like crouching with their back against the wall or standing up or sitting crisscross like on the ground. And then as soon as they came out, we, it's called a gaggle. Everybody sticks their recorders out and kind of like shoves them over everybody else's heads. Or if you're like a short guy, you can kind of like weasel your way through. So I've probably done, you know, like two dozen of those at least, I would say. Um, or you're walking down the stairs like in the court or courthouse or state house and like the guys right next to you and you're like oh I got a quick question for you you stick your mic out it happens like that sometimes they won't answer you sometimes they'll just ignore you and walk away um, mm. but uh, yeah I saw Sheldon Silver like right before he was going on trial walking into an elevator and some guy I was interviewing uh, like this uh, good government advocate I guess you could call him kind of like slapped Sheldon Silver on the back while he was going in and he said better get used to the tight quarters talking to like a jail cell. Right, right. <laughs> uh, but sometimes those spontaneous moments, right? Um, yeah. And getting a spontaneous quote from someone like Sheldon Silver when he doesn't have time to run it past a lawyer or their chief of staff or whatever, and you're really getting authenticity. I think the reader can notice that. Yeah, of course. And like the color like that too, you know, you won't get those same kind of details. Like I would never know this guy slapped Sheldon Silver on the back as he was walking into an elevator if I was sitting at my desk, right. you know? So it's like these different, you know, I. We do sit at my desk. I sit at my desk a lot at work, um, you know, on the computer, calling people. But I always try to get out of the office because, you know, you never know what kind of stories you might get. I think one of the other stories, uh, the name change story like he's going to show you, mm -hmm. that all stemmed from me like bumping into some guy at a courthouse. And it kind of just like developed from that. And I would have never gotten it if I didn't like step outside my office that day. That's a great segue because that's the next story actually I wanted to talk Perfect. to you about. So uh, we'll put up that name change story. This is from April 9th of 2017. And you see the headline there, what's in a name? Another one of Nick's many front page stories, which is very impressive by the way, to have a reporter who's only a few years into a job regularly getting front page stories is a real credit to your reporting. Um, and I just want to read this lead because I also really like the lead and I want to talk to you uh, after I read about like, what do you put into a lead? What kind of things you're considering to get the reader's attention in that first paragraph? Uh, so the lead of this story, Michael Angelo Ortiz has lived 54 years under a name that wasn't his. When he was born, his mother gave him a fake name at the hospital because his father was in jail. His name on his birth certificate was Miguel Angel Rivera. So it's a lead that certainly in that first sentence, he has lived 54 years under a name that wasn't his. It just catches your attention. It begs you to read on. I talk about this class all the time, that curiosity factor. So can you speak to when you're formulating a lead, and specifically this one, what goes into that? Yeah, of course. So that was the guy I bumped into at the courthouse. Um, so, uh, so pretty much, you know, we have all these tools online, all these analytics that I look at every day. Every journalist everywhere is looking at them. And uh, we call them metrics, and we kind of look who's reading the stories, who's clicking what, how much are they reading, how long. But the rules have really always been the same for the past 150 years. You know, you write a good headline, you write a good first two sentences, you want to draw people's attention in. That's never changed. So, uh, you know, some, sometimes when it just comes to me, I like write a lead first before I can even, usually I write the lead first. I can't really go on to the story until I write the lead. And with, with this guy, it was kind of like, wow, you know, you've been trying to change your name for 54 years, but they're not letting you do it because they can't find, you know, you in like the public records. Like it was just like this really bizarre thing. He lived like 54 years and he just like found out it was because his mom lied to uh, the people at the hospital. And that kind of like stuck with me. And I was like, that's really interesting. I've never heard of anything like that. 
I bet you nobody else has either. So it was like, he's going up in the very top of this story. I actually talked to like four or five different people for this story. And it was all about, you know, like name change trends. And that's like another funny thing, you know, I'm the investigative reporter, but some of the stuff I'm investigating isn't really like hard hitting news. I just noticed like there was a big trend in the last like five years through legal notices of like more people requesting to change their names. Was it because there's more immigrants trying to change their names to sound more American, more transgender people feeling more comfortable about going about doing this legally or just like, you know, something else. And it was, it was a huge trend. It was like something from like 20 to 30 people, like in 2013 to like 150 to 200 people in like 2018, it was like increasing each year. So uh, yeah, so I kind of, you know, built off of that idea and uh, interviewed different people why they were changing their names. And uh, he was definitely the one that stood out the most who was going at the top. I know it's hard to maybe break down exactly the process of picking out the right lead, but is there a little bit of a paint by numbers or things that you start to look for? For example, I often talk to my students about starting a lead with someone's name, especially when you're writing a feature story, obviously not in hard news, but when you're doing this kind of a story, having that immediate connection with the person. Yeah. So by starting, you know, met Michael, and hello Ortiz, you know, is that a technique you often use? Yeah, definitely, I really do. I don't know if that's actually a technique or not, but mm -hmm. I've usually, especially with feature stories, but sometimes even with like hard news stories, like if somebody's at like a scene of an accident or like a shooting or something like that, you might want to lead with like the human connection. Uh, Cause sometimes when you're leading off with like a hard data, like numbers story, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a disconnect and you're gonna bore people. You know, there, there could have been 300 people that changed their names in Central Jersey in the last five years and it's kind of like, who cares, you know? But if you find like this human factor that people can connect to and relate to, maybe somebody else had an uncle who, you know, changed their names or something like that. You're really looking for that connection with your readership. Mm. Um, so moving on to another story I want to talk about from this past summer that you did. This is from June 3rd of 2018, we'll put it up, called uh, Picking Up Officials Health Tab. So you see it there, a co-authored story that you were on in the right uh, side of the screen. Uh, so just to give a little bit of an introduction into this story, it's about expensive health insurance. Uh, premiums are caught in a slow upward spiral, and because employers are faced with higher costs, employees' contributions for their insurance have also steadily risen, gnawing a hole, that's a great word, gnawing, a hole in tra uh, taxpayers' wallets. So uh, you have some great stats in this particular story. I talk a lot with students about in the nut graph of a story, you need to support, you can't just have a great personal story, uh, like you had with Mr. Ortiz before. You also want to have some stats to support it, to give justification for why you're writing about this. So the stats specifically in this story from the Henry Kaiser Family Foundation, it's a long title here, mm -hmm. the Henry Kaiser Family Foundation Health Research and Education 2017 Employee Health Benefits Survey. That's a mouthful. Uh, but you have, it sounds legitimate, it adds some sort of credibility to the story. So are you looking for stats or some other way of backing up whatever trend you're saying is taking place? Yeah, of course. So like that name change story, probably, it is called the nut graph, probably like three or four paragraphs down, you kind of like, I usually like to say you zoom in at the beginning and then like three or four paragraphs down, you kind of zoom out and look at the whole issue and then like kind of zoom back in and make it more personalized. Uh, this whole story, this took a lot of Oprah requests. I, this is the one I would like Oprah at every single town in Central Jersey. And it was like this huge waiting game. It took like months. Um, but basically it kind of like came from this whole idea where you had these politicians that were kind of touting their, uh, you know, like their effective conservative uh, policies. You know, we're not raising the taxes. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. But you're, you know, we're paying $60,000 a year for your health premium, uh, for your health insurance. And you're only paying like, $2,000 for the last five years, while meanwhile, most people who are working are paying much more than that. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like what that study found. Like most Americans pay like 10 times more uh, than their average elected, elected official uh, pays for their health benefits. And it was kind of like this thing, uh, Somerset County and hundred and really conservative areas, people care a lot about, you know, property taxes, uh, their other taxes, and they want to always see like what they're contributing to. Because a lot of times you don't. And uh, those OPRs really, it came in handy because I was looking at uh, publicly available data, which is on every, I was looking at their budgets. And then from there, you could see how many like council members on their budget uh, were receiving benefits. Some council members don't, they pay for it themselves and just do it from their full-time employer. Um, and then from there, I would send an OPRA to the town and say, I'm requesting, you know, the last five years, whoever's on the health benefits uh, in this town and then, uh, you know, I would get the data from there. So it was really like looking at the budgets for each one of these towns, downloading the budget, analyzing that, 
and then going a step further and then sending a request out to kind of like expand on those numbers. And then we found there was like a ton. There was like 120 elected officials who were receiving health benefits. Yeah, I actually want to show that's the next graphic I want to put up there was kind of the continuation, the second page of story. And you can kind of see, I know it's hard from the audience, but in that top is the list of all those elected officials that Nick was just talking about. The elected county and municipal officials in Central Jersey who were enrolled in health benefits resulting in costs of tens of thousands of dollars. So you already discussed a little bit about how you got that information. Um, is there ever a concern when you're running names of people like this? And there's been issues with journalists over the years, an ethical concern about we have whatever piece of information, could be someone's address, it could be their age, identifying information that could be personal, someone who doesn't want that out there. Uh, do you ever consider those sorts of things? Has there been repercussions or threats of lawsuits and stuff like that when you run it? Yeah, um, you know, you get angry callers. I probably get one a week. You get guys I call you anonymously, kind of like, you better watch your back kind of stuff. And it's like, really guy, you know, my name, my phone number's right there. You can't even call me with like, without a blocked number, but you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, but when it's like an elected official, um, it really, you know, most people expect that. If they're running for office, they should know. They're gonna be like in the public light People want to know what's going on, you know, with you if you're a public official and we're paying for your health benefits. Um, so with public officials, it's really not that we, we wouldn't publish like their home address. You know, we would say like maybe what town they're from. Mm -hmm. But I mean, all that stuff is available anyway. Like if somebody really wanted to know, they could just type in like John Smith's home address, you know, on Google, do a couple Boolean searches. Um, other guys, you know, like fire departments, uh, if there's something that, you know, like a lawsuit, like if there's a lawsuit, that's fair game. It's a public record. They pay $200 to file that, um, and they want to go win a lawsuit. So why don't we, you know, write it in the newspaper? If there's a public mm -hmm. official suing the police department, or you know, it happens all the time. There's sheriff's officers that are constantly sh suing the sheriff's department, and they're never going to want to tell you that. You just kind of got to find it, or somebody's going to tip you off and you request it, and then you know you write it from that. Um, there's a fire chief that was arrested for a DWI, and it was like months before I found out about it. Um, and they weren't going to tell anybody about it. And then I found it, and I wrote the story, and, like, next week he retires. You know, so mm -hmm. it's unfortunate. Sometimes stuff like that does happen. But, like, you know, it really depends, like, on a case-by-case -case basis, you know. It, that one was just so egregious. The police said, uh, you know, he was driving down uh, from Union County down to Jackson. And uh, when they pulled him over, he had vomit and uh, urine, like, all over himself, supposedly, according to the police report. And people got, that got picked up by the New York Post. So I wrote that story. They saw it and they're like, fire chief pulled over with vomit and urine on themselves. They put that in the headline, obviously. <laughs> so people call me and they're all mad at me. Like, why'd you have to put that detail in there? But it really shows you, you know, some people get pulled over for your DWI, but they're not, you know, they don't have vomit on themselves. Right. It shows you how far this guy probably was, you know, how drunk he allegedly was. Yeah. That kind of detail. And the police thought it was important, so they put it in there. Well, and just to pick up on something you said at the start there about getting maybe these anonymous blocked phone calls where people are even saying, watch your back, that can be really scary and intimidating to get as a young reporter. You're just starting here and uh, maybe, you know, maybe having second thoughts, I don't know, about this sort of a career. Has there been moments where you're concerned for your own safety as a reporter and how do you handle those sorts of things? Um, usually I'm somebody that likes to talk to people like over the phone, like I'll kind of, you know, I'll stand up for what I think I did was right and I'll kind of talk to them and understand where they're coming from. Um, I've had people tell me on both sides, you know, on the same day actually, this is like really funny, you probably won't believe it, but I was like working at uh, like this 4-H fair handing out papers and, you know, being like the representative from the paper and somebody comes up and, you know, I used to be subscribed to your paper, but you guys have become too liberal, so I canceled my subscription. Later that day, two hours later, you used to be subscribed to your paper, but you're too conservative these days. <laughs> it's like, all right, well, we must be doing something right. You know, nobody's right. happy. But, uh, but no, you know, some, I just spoke to this guy that wandered into my office uh, last week um, claiming that the government uh, put him under and surgically implanted tracking devices in his mind. And he was like, you know, talking to me with his hands in his pocket, telling me, you know, you see all these mass shootings that are on the news. It's not really the people doing it. It's the government inside their heads. And he's like talking to me with his hands like in this trench coat. I'm like, all right, well, I wish this guy could have called in, but I'm just going to, you know, take notes and talk to him, tell him, you know, I'll look into it. But you should really try contacting other sources. And it's sad, you know, this guy probably had a mental illness and he kind of slipped through the cracks and nobody's really. And that's another story. But, you know, sometimes stuff like that does happen. And we have a lock on our office door, but, you know, the whole door is glass. Somebody really wanted to get in there. They're going to get in there. Mm. Um, but we didn't know what that guy was going to say. He could have had like a good story, so we let him in. 
And I kind of got, just got like roped into sitting down with them. Yeah, but that is scary, right? Because we're seeing, of course, mass shootings, unfortunately, going on across the United States, but especially in newsrooms lately, um, you know, and CNN had it and uh, paper in Maryland. And so there's now a concern about this could happen. You write a negative story. Uh, or somebody just doesn't like your coverage for whatever reason, or they're, they're just mentally ill. And newspapers, journalists beg for transparency from their sources. So one way of, uh, you know, we try to be transparent ourselves. Uh, but is there ever moments like that where you think that maybe th there should be more safeguarding, you know, or uh, locking yourselves inside or being a little bit more separate from the public? Yeah, it's like what's going on right now is like a huge tragedy with the attacks on journalists. And, you know, we don't have to really even get into that, but it's sad. But uh uh, like my office had to have the sheriff's office come in and kind of give us a training on active shooting. Like that mm -hmm. never happened at my office before. So it's kind of like, yeah, this is a real world threat. AP has like, uh, you know, the president of security for like their whole newsroom. He was like a former uh, Rams linebacker, I'm pretty sure. I can't remember the guy's name, but I met him. So yeah, you know, there is a concern for journalist safety. Uh, Charlie Hebdo happened, uh, like when was that, 2014? That was right. horrible. And it's like, it's a global thing, you know, and it's really not so bad. We have it in New Jersey. We just think it's bad because it's like our perspective. But you see what's going on like in, you know, what, what just happened in, uh, in Turkey with Saudi Arabia. Uh, right. But what happens like in Mexico, like every day with the cartel going in the newsrooms, like chopping off people's heads. Uh, there's like that whole uh, compilation of like the World Press Index, I think it is, where it's like the worst countries to be a journalist in and the most free and transparent countries to be a journalist in. And uh, I think... United States is something like 40 on the list. We're not even like in the top 10. Right. Kind of hard to believe. And uh, actually, a good segue to my next point, which was going to be about President Trump. Um, so in mid-August, Trump was in Bedminster, and you talked about being at Trump National many times. Uh, so he was about 15 minutes from your apartment, your office in Somerville, and you were filling in for the USA Today White House press pool for that day. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that experience, about being part of this press pool covering the President of the United States? Yeah, so, uh, so I was called by USA Today to uh, cover uh, this kind of contingency of Trump when he was in Trump National. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't actually get to go out and meet the president, uh, but I did have to like write for the national press pool, which means like all the other big newspapers across the country that are part of the press pool were looking at my updates about what was going on that day. They canceled it because they didn't have any planned public appearances, but uh, if it was on, I was going to go there and you know meet the president uh, for what was going on uh, that weekend. But other times, you know, they call it Camp David of, Camp David of the North because it's where he really prefers to spend his summer because uh, Florida gets too hot. So the president comes up to Bedminster, which is like 10 minutes from my office. And uh, Bedminster is like this really unique area, uh, super wealthy. Um, like Steve Forbes lived there. Uh, the guy Newhouse uh, lives in Bedminster or lived in Bedminster. I'm not sure which one was. Uh, the lady at the Merck family, they're from Bedminster. Uh, but his golf course is there, and uh, out of all the golf courses in the country, he decides to come back to Bedminster. So whenever he's there, there's obviously protests and people outside. So I've had to cover like multiple protests at Bedminster, um, speak to people that are, uh, you know, organizing these. They're trying to get like the Trump baby balloons that they had like in Europe, mm -hmm. and he didn't really like them that much. They're <laughs> trying to bring them to Bedminster, so I was like covering that. Um, I, Bedminster Township has like their meetings like within Trump National, like they're township reorganization meetings and they've been doing that since before he was elected president so they're still doing that and I was like inside Trump's like uh, clubhouse like covering like a local town meeting which was like kind of like this surreal thing like on one of the lowest levels of the government inside like the highest level of the government's like playhouse you know, it's yeah kind of funny well and to the point you were just saying about journalists being under attack it's interesting because in this situation you're covering a president who has obviously put journalists under attack himself and called them the enemy of the people and fake news and all of these sorts of nasty things that have been going back and forth. So it's weird because journalists are becoming part of the story, something we never really want to be, right? We always like to cover the story but not really be in front of the camera. Is it difficult when you're covering an elected official? And not just Trump, but I've heard of certainly it filtering down his same rhetoric, going yeah. to maybe local officials, maybe you even face this from Chris Christie or some other uh, you know, local officials. Uh, have you seen that in your reporting? Um, yeah, well, I cover this thing called the Far Hills Race Meeting. It's like the largest steeplechase. I don't know if you know what the steeplechase is. I didn't really know what it is either before I started, but it's like a horse race where the horses jump over like the fences and it's like really big and the UK, but there's a huge one here in America that's in uh, Somerset County. Uh, I've been covering it for three years before Trump was elected and then the two years after he was elected. And uh, 
like visibly could see like a change in the people I was talking to when I came up and like introduced myself as a reporter running a newspaper story about a horse race, you know, like about a horse race. It wasn't political at all, mm. but somehow they're like, what are you going to do? Put a spin on it? You're going to make this fake news? Like, it's like, what? No, it's a horse race. Like, <laughs> if you don't want to talk to me, don't talk to me. But like, come on, you know, right. eventually, you know, you get the job done. It just makes it a little more difficult when you're at the rallies. It's, you know, it's different because you see people, you know, throwing stuff or like, wearing vulgar, vulgar t-shirts that say, you know, rope, tree, journalist, some assembly required, which is like mm -hmm. an awful thing. Um, but, you know, really, it's like journalists' favorite saying, you know, there's no such thing as bad press. He says, New York Times is failing so much, you look at their stock, you look at their stock price, it's been going up like the last two years. So mm -hmm. it's like, what's going on there? Right, right. So it's this ironic situation that's going on. Yeah. Um, so I have a few more questions for Nick. Just a reminder, we're going to put up Twitter questions pretty soon, so please get your Twitter account, Sandy. Hashtag Hobart Reality Check. Any questions you might have for Nick about his reporting. Uh, but a few other things I want to talk about, some of your recent stories. Just last Thursday, you had a story about a Union County woman who was suing the New Jersey State Police for allegedly physically assaulting her when she was pulled over, I think, in 2016 traffic stop. Uh, so you can just talk to us a little bit about reporting on that since it's a recent one. Yeah, this is the actual story from it. Um, I don't know if you guys really keep up with, like, transparency news. I do because I'm, like, a nerd. I don't think anybody else really cares about it besides journalists and professors. But uh, New Jersey just did this really cool thing uh, where they took the civil case search, and now you can look up any case on the website from like the last two years, like straight from your computer, you don't have to go to the courthouse and you can see like all these lawsuits that are filed and it like makes, I used to go to the courthouse and request these lawsuits. I, I would have to go out to, uh, you know, Somerset County for a Somerset County lawsuit or like Middlesex County. Now I can just do it from my computer and print it out. So like you can sit there all day and like type in anybody's name, who's suing who, you know. And this was like one of those stories. I got this awesome story of the lady suing the state police alleging that she was, uh, I think the quote in the lawsuit was, uh, brutally physically assaulted and maliciously prosecuted because she called 911 during a police stop. Mm. And uh, she kind of like got all these charges, like 14 different charges, and all of them were dropped in court after like two years of this going on. You know, it affected her. She said it affected like, her work. She had to take off time. She lives like up in uh, Union County. She would have to come down to Somerset, drive, take time off, like go to court. And eventually it was all dropped. Like it never happened, you know, but it did because for two years she had, you know, plan all this time. She doesn't want to miss court. She's going to get another charge or a penalty for that. So it was like this huge thing that was going on. So then once those charges were dropped, she was like, all right, I'm going to sue the police department for, uh, you know, wrongfully prosecuting me. So, uh, so right now I'm trying to get the videos for that because police have to wear the dash cam and the body cam footage, mm. um, which is because of the, because of transparency news, uh, because of a Supreme Court ruling in New Jersey, that stuff is available uh, to the public. So that, that'll really show you exactly what happened there. You know, sometimes they say one thing, but it's not really what happens on the video, whether it's the plaintiff or the police, you know, sometimes it's a, a discrepancy between the two. And although you say the Supreme Court ruling says that that should be publicly available, I'm sure that you could still meet a lot of resistance from officials. It's not like they're just putting it up on a website and saying, you know, no. here you can download it automatically. Of course not. Yeah, so it's still a struggle to tr kind of get that kind of stuff that yeah, should be Yeah, Oprah Law leaves tons of loopholes for people to, like, navigate. So it's really great for public officials. It's really bad for journalists. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so a few other quick stories I just want to talk about, things that you've done. Uh, this one that you were talking about doing in the spring of 2017 into, I guess, the early summer, New Jersey's most well-known Nazi, who was legally changing his surname to Hitler, and this is a wild story, right, about someone changing his name to Hitler, went around the globe and was picked up by American tabloids like the New York Post, which you've mentioned before, is, seems to they really like, like your reporting. <laughs> um, a lot of the sensational things that they like about it, but also in the... Uh, across the pond, right, in the Daily Mail and in the Times of Israel. Uh, so can you talk about reporting that story and some of the specific challenges there when, because uh, it's something that we have to do sometimes as reporters too, right, deal with people who we find reprehensible personally and they're maybe spewing hate and things that, uh, you know, make us uncomfortable, but yet we kind of have this weird obligation to tell their side of a story. So Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. So, uh, so this was kind of like another one of these things that I saw in a legal notice, you know, legal notices are things that people have to publish in a newspaper just by law. Like if somebody wants to change their name, they have to publish it in a legal notice saying, I'm trying to change my name, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and it was Isidore Campbell. And we remember him uh, from when he tried to put 
uh, happy birthday, Adolf Hitler, on a birthday cake. Uh, I think it was like Acme or ShopRite. Like they refused to do it. And it was like another global story. That was like early 2000s. And then this guy's kind of like back in the news. He's from Huntington County. I cover it. He's going to be in Huntington County Courthouse trying to change his last name legally from Campbell to Hitler. It was like, that's crazy. I want to be there for that. So I go there, and it was kind of like this weird, this weird thing where I was like the only reporter there. Um, he was supposed to go in front of a judge, but because nobody was there contesting his name change, he didn't have to like appear before a judge. It was just like handled electronically. So like he never appeared before the judge, and I'm kind of sitting there like, when is this going to go on? So I go up to the clerk, and they're like, oh, no, he already did this. And I was like, what? And I was like, I wasn't in the room for that. So mm -hmm. he goes back and like talks to this lady. Uh, eventually, after like a lot of back and forth, uh, they told me I would have to like submit an OPRA to get the documents, and I was like, I'm right here. It just happened. Can't you just give it to me? I'm going to drive out here in seven days to get this. You're going to do more work over the next week. Can't we just make everybody's lives easier if you just gave me the document right now? Because I know you have it. And uh, he like he's like, okay, hold on. And then like goes back to talks to the lady. I hear them like debating. He comes back and gives me the document, and uh, and his phone number was on there. So I had Isidore Hitler's phone number. And uh, yeah, the the worst or the best part of the story is when I was in the office and I'm you know. Mr. Hitler, and everybody in the office like turns around and looks at me like, who are you talking to? But uh, yeah, that really just progressed because you know he requested his name change. We didn't know if the judge was going to grant it or not. He did. His name was legally Hitler, and then we just did like a bunch of stories after that. Like, he was like a big Trump fan. I put that like in one quote in a story, not in the whole story about that, just like one quote because he was like adamant about it. He's like, you got to mention this. So I did, and somebody got real upset about it and called me up. That was like the guy who was like, you better watch your back. It's because I put like this Trump quote from this neo-Nazi or like this actual Nazi. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so he, that was like a really weird relationship because obviously I don't like Nazis. Um, but I can't tell the guy <laughs> I don't like you because he was like giving me good stories. Um, so he would like, after a while, you know, it was kind of like I got to keep my distance a little bit. Um, but he would like, you know, call me on like an anonymous number and like get me to pick up because I was like ignoring his calls. And he's like, I'm moving to Germany. He wrote the story about me moving to Germany. I'm going to start like a Nazi army in Germany. I was like, yeah, okay, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> so it was like, after a while, it was like, you can't keep putting like a guy named Hitler in the paper. People don't like it. Right. It's, you know, it was interesting when he changed his name to Hitler, but you can't just keep writing about Hitler. Yeah, well, I think sometimes journalists are afraid of being pawns, like kind of being used by their sources, right? And it can happen with politicians using us. Of course. Uh, but in this case, it sounds like it was crossing that barrier a little bit from being, this is a legitimate, sensational story. It has the novelty aspect of journalism we talk about. There's something unusual and bizarre that makes it a news story. But then if we keep reporting it, we're giving a voice to people who are just viewing hate and all these negative things. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's interesting because most of the good tips we get are from you know, because of political divisiveness, mm -hmm. divisiveness. Mm -hmm. They don't like each other, so they're calling us saying, oh, you got to look into so-and-so doing this. And we do, but we always look at the other side, too. You know, you have to provide both sides of the story. Um, happens all the time, actually. You know, most of the tips we get are people that are trying to out the other side, unfortunately. That's just how it goes. Yeah. Um, all right, one more story I want to talk to you about before we go to all of your Twitter questions. So, again, last time, get hashtag Hobart Reality Check up there. Uh, one story you said you want to talk about, a longtime fire chief had retired after you wrote a story about him getting arrested in charge of DWI. I know we may have talked a little bit about this before, but any more details you want to give yeah, about Yeah, that was another one where it was like this anonymous tip, uh, you know, the fire chief was just given a DWI. It's like, what, really? I didn't know about that. Like, right. why did we not know that? He's still the fire chief. Right. He's still driving around the fires, you know what I mean? He's supposed to be like the guy, like, pulling people out of the cars from DWI wrecks, right, right. not the guy getting pulled over for a DWI. So the guy's name was William Young, and it's like, all right, there's probably like 10,000 William Youngs in New Jersey. This guy's probably just mistaken. But, of course, you got to check out, like, any tip, because that would be a good story if it was true. But sometimes, and most of the time, uh, things are too good to be true. So, uh, But this was one of the ones that actually panned out. I managed to, like, match up the birth date on the uh, police report, and it was the same guy. And it was kind of like this unfortunate thing where I kind of got it. I had to get him to confirm it. And he was always like a really nice guy. And just because he got a DWI doesn't mean he's not a nice guy, obviously. Uh, and he's always been, you know, he worked well with our paper. So I called him up, uh, told the secretary I'm doing a story on the fire department. Can I talk to the chief? He gets put on the phone and he's like, hey, how you doing? And I was like, uh, yeah, I'm looking at this lawsuit. I mean, uh, this police report it says you're, you've been uh, given a DWI. Uh, do you have any comment on that? And like immediately he was like, how did you get that? And I was like, all right, I know I got the guy. Mm -hmm. You got the right guy. Wow. Um, and of course, there's always issues there with uh, any sort of reporting in a local setting where everyone knows each other and maybe 
it's a legitimate story, reporting on this fire chief, but you may risk other people in the fire department or that local town disliking you yeah. just because you reported the truth. Uh, but sometimes people don't want that yeah, truth out that, there. Yeah, that was Rahway. And they had, they had a mayor named Samson Steinman that was crashing into parked cars like multiple times he did it. Like early in the morning, uh, crashed like 2 a.m., 2.30 a.m., like into a parked car. And like two months later, like four in the morning, crashed into a parked car. It's kind of like, what's going on with this guy? So, you know, we did this story. Uh, we got all the police video and dash cam footage. And uh, he was never given a DWI, just like careless driving and like driving without a license uh, on him. Uh, but yeah, you, you know, we would see like the comments in the Facebook pages like, Mayor, you're doing a good job. Keep it up. Stay strong. Like all the people like supporting him. It's just like one of these towns where, you know, a lot of community spirit uh, and they're really, you know, tight knit. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if the mayor's crashing the parked cars, eventually, what happened to Samson Steinman, he had to resign. Uh, he went to rehab, actually. Uh, and then he was, uh, he's being sued by a former staff member for sexual uh, harassment. Mm -hmm. So. Wow, it's a long history there. And the sports reporters <coughs> talk about that, too, about, you know, if you have to make sure that you have, like, all the teammates, you know, together, because if you have one guy who dislikes you, then it filters throughout the rest of the locker room. They say, don't talk to Nick because he's a bad reporter or whatever. So you got to be really careful there. Or it certainly happens in, in lots of different small yeah. beats um, where one's... No, of you know, course, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all the time. Yeah. Police departments, fire departments, uh, councils, yeah. school boards. Yeah. So I have some other things I want to talk to you about, but let's get to some of the Twitter questions. So we'll put them up on the screen right now and see what, uh, what folks have uh, for you. Wow. So, uh, yeah, you see, look, you got a lot. You're very popular. They're all from the New York Post. Um, but, no, I, let's put up uh, Maria first, and she's our WPSBJ president we heard from before. How do you cope with the stress of tight deadlines? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so my paper is a part of a chain of newspapers in New Jersey owned by Gannett. Um, and our deadline used to be like 7.30, 8.30 when I started there. Uh, it seems like every year it gets earlier and earlier. I think now I gotta have stories in by 4.30. I can like push five. And it's just because we're all printing papers from the same place and, uh, and we're, one, we're not like the largest paper in the state so they get like the later deadlines. Asbury Park Press, Bergen Record, um, and then uh, Courier Post and then me. Uh, but yeah, you just, it's not too stressful sometimes, honestly. Uh, I'm pretty good at like planning stuff out. I'm a really quick writer. Um, so when I know that I have a deadline, I'll just like get in the office, type out the shell, make my calls. And I, I don't think I've ever missed a deadline, to be honest, um, with anything. I'm just like super proactive about it. I guess some people type, I work, I'm the youngest guy in my office. I work with people that have been doing this for like decades. And I had people in my office that literally type with one finger, like on the keyboard, you know? But they managed to pump out like three stories a day. And it's kind of like, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. Works like, for them. They know, figured I'm doing it like out. QWERTY, you know? Yeah. So, uh, no, but you just really, yeah, it's like proactive. You, get, you have to be a good planner. And I'm not the best planner. I always mm -hmm. buy like those daily planners and stop filling them out after like a week or two. And they just kind of like sit in my bag or on my desk. <laughs> uh, but usually I'm a, I'm a sticky note guy. So I stick like a ton of sticky notes like all over my desk and on my computer. If there's something I have to get done the next day, I'll write it on a sticky note and stick it on my keyboard. So like when I come in, it's like the first thing I see. Mm, that's it's just like a weird technique I got. Definitely not good for the environment. <laughs> that's something I've heard a lot from journalism students though, that concern about going from a college environment where you have a lot of time, right? To, yeah. They may not feel like it right now, it is a but a lot time. of time to like work on some stories and then going to like an unpredictable thing where you may come in and your boss says, hey Nick, by the end of the day, I want this done or sometimes much sooner, right? You got to get quotes right away and be able to write really fast and all that. Yeah, sometimes we do like these uh, nationwide stories and since I'm like the watchdog reporter, they're like a lot to do with like data. So they put me on the story and it's like, kind of ironic because you know some of the bigger papers that are in our network they have much more manpower than we do and much less space to cover like they'll mm -hmm. do two counties it's like their coverage zone I'm like one guy doing four counties so like it's like twice as much work when you're looking at data stories because there's twice as many places but we always have the same deadline right so it's like how's that fair you know <laughs> but you make it work um, yeah so those things sometimes it's kind of just like you pick it up and like throw it at the wall and see what sticks and you just like run with it and then you kind of see the story shape as you go on, as you start calling people. Uh, but yeah, sometimes the deadlines are like two or three months for that. They usually always get pushed back. But uh, yeah, you just kind of like work with it. Really. Yeah, you learn, you know, you get that experience and you know how to deal with deadlines. Let's see what else we've got uh, up there for you. 
Um, so we have Alex Evans, who is the WPSBJ treasurer. Do you have a favorite story that you've written or one that you are most proud of? Yeah, um, I think the name change story is one of my favorites. It's definitely my favorite front page I've ever had, and I really like that black head with like the text in it. It's really cool. Um, we have a really good design team where we did, uh, the, it was outsourced to Phoenix, believe it or not, to a Gannett hub out there that were designing newspapers for New Jersey. Um, so that's probably one of my favorite stories, just because it was so interesting, and uh, I just really loved the way I wrote it. It kind of just like was one of those things that just like flew off my fingertips as I was writing it. Um, one of my most proud pieces of work would probably be this freelance story that I just wrote about uh, New Jersey's bail reform. It's like another thing that most people don't really know about, but it's going on and it's affecting a lot of people. Um, we just changed our bail system from being dependent on cash, meaning the judge could say, you know, you can be released if you pay $10,000 or $50,000, to being dependent on risk, which means if you're not a risk to your community based on your past crimes or your appearances in court, we'll let you go. Otherwise, you're here, no bail. You just got to wait it out, basically. Mm. It's kind of like this weird thing where, like, for the first time, there's not really a right to bail. It's like, you know, it's kind of taken away. Um, and I wrote the story about NJ Weedman. Uh, he's like this famous marijuana advocate. He was in jail for like 447 days um, underneath the Bail Reform Act for a third degree charge of witness tampering, which isn't really even like a violent crime. Usually they hold people in jail if it's like murder or like kidnapping or attempted murder. Um, but he was there and anytime you submit a motion, there's like all like these weird things underneath this law. There's 180 days upon indictment, somebody has to be taken to trial. So within 180 days, you have to be taken to trial. But if you submit any motion uh, before trial, the judge has 60 days to kind of like decide that motion, and those 60 days are excludable time. They don't count towards the 180 days. So like you submit three motions, like a change of counsel, or like you want to represent yourself, or you're asking for some kind of discovery. That's 180 days right there. It doesn't count at all. You just spend 180 days, and it doesn't count. So like people are saying, you know, you're forcing people to plea out. You're not giving them a chance to fight their case, because if they do, they're going to be held in jail longer. Why don't they just take the plea deal right off the bat, you know, because mm -hmm. then they're out of, jail, out of jail sooner. NJ Weedman didn't want to do that, because he's kind of like this guy that gives like the middle finger to the government all the time. And he went to trial, and he beat it, and he was like found not guilty, and he spent 447 days in jail without a conviction underneath New Jersey's bail reform. But then, you know, you look at it on the other side, um, and it helps a lot of poor people get out of jail that would probably be sitting in jail before that can't afford a $500 cash bail. Mm -hmm. So it really does help a lot of people, but the ones that get stuck in it, it really, you know, it really doesn't look good for them. It's kind of amazing that you've only been a reporter for a few years and you already have all of these amazing stories. It's part of what I tell people why you should become a journalist, right? Because yeah. you're just all of these crazy experiences that you mean incredibly no interesting people too. Yeah, like yeah. Weed Man, people think he's like a gimmick. He kind of is. Like his name is so goofy. He does that for publicity. But he's like a super smart guy. Like he's represented himself so many times uh, in court. He's kind of just like a law book. He knows so much about the system. He's like, he has like a photographic memory basically. He remembers like all these dates and stuff. And like you're talking to him on the phone. You're like, yeah, sure, that was that day. You look it up and he's like, right. And he's telling you this from like a jail cell. He's not looking it up anywhere. So uh, I had 48 hours of like recorded conversations with him from his jail cell. And it took me like eight months. I was doing this without getting paid. Uh, you know, I wasn't doing it for my job. I was doing this freelance without getting paid, just kind of working on it when I had downtime. It took me like eight months to write. I got $250 at the end of it, you know, which isn't really that much if you think about the work that went into it. But it was a really important story uh, that I thought had to get out there. And I'm really, I'm really proud of it. Yes, let's go through some more of these. Uh, we have Jada Clark, who's a student, graduate student in our uh, master's program in professional communication here, what would you be doing if you weren't a journalist? Oh my God, I can't imagine you as anything besides a journalist. <laughs> yeah, but, that's, a, that's a funny one. Yeah. Uh, back when I was in J school, in journalism school, uh, you would go to class and there was kids that were in those classes that were you know, planning on going into communications or PR and it was kind of like, screw you, like you're on the dark side, like you already made that decision. And it's like now that I'm working and living it, you can't really blame them. You know? You don't get paid a lot of money, unfortunately, unless you're at like the New York Times or Bloomberg or Wall Street Journal. Uh, but it is like really rewarding. Um, but if I wasn't a journalist, I'd probably be doing something in like communications, I'd say. Uh, probably like PR for a public university or uh, some kind of corporate PR for, or like maybe for a politician. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I've had a lot of friends who've made that transition. Our first reality check guest was actually a friend of mine from the Daily News, Sarah Armagon, who had been a reporter there, was a reporter at Newsday. And at the time we scheduled the reality check, she still was reporting at Newsday. But then by the time she came, she had left to become a spokesperson really? for the Long Island Railroad. Wow. Um, and that's happened many times. Lots of my friends from the Daily News have gone. It happens all the time. Through, people, yeah. people go in and out, actually. I've seen people go out of journalism, and like into PR, and then back into journalism. I've seen people that were like chief of staffs of people, and then like going to, not really chief of staff, but like on like, politicians teams and then they go like into journalism like it's like kind of weird but it definitely happens a lot yeah um jerry green the late assemblyman one time i don't know if he was joking or not but kind of like asked me if i wanted to work for him like over the phone it's kind of like what <laughs> like that's so weird you're going to be saying that to a journalist who's like writing a story about you right now <laughs> but uh it was kind of like this joke in the office you know i obviously wasn't interested but uh right. he ended up passing away a couple years later but mm -hmm. he was always he was always really fun to interview yeah interesting all right I just want to make sure we get to as many of these student questions as we can. So Michelle Sis, who's another one of our graduate students. Hey, Nick, knowing how dangerous being an international journalist can be in certain parts of the world, would you ever take on a task if it meant potentially endangering your life? It sounds like you've already had some brushes with that sort of stuff. Yeah, actually, I was going to see, we, we won't do it now, but maybe later I'll show you this video. Uh, I've been to a couple active shootings. Uh, there was one in Highbridge. It was like a standoff at like, this guy's house. And Highbridge is like, in, I don't know if anybody knows where that is. It's like really in the middle of nowhere in Huntington County. Um, and it was like in the woods in this guy's neighborhood, just like these winding trails. And uh, I was the only reporter there again. Um, and I'm kind of like sitting there like I can't see the house, but I see like the police blockage. And I like was waiting and I was like heard some shouting. I was there for like hours, you know, waiting for this thing to resolve so I could like write a story about it. But I started like hearing some shouting, like, do it, just shoot me, just do it. I was like, oh crap, I'm gonna take my phone out. And I just like hit record and I'm sitting there and then like all of a sudden I hear like these gunshots and it kind of like shakes my body because it was like so loud. I was like, oh crap, there's actually like, shooting and I'm like in the woods, I don't know, you know, I don't know where the bullets are coming from, you mm. know. The guy wasn't actually killed, but there was like, sh I guess they shot like some, uh, I don't know if they were like smoke bombs or like stun bullets at the guy uh, through the house, but that's what that noise was. I've been, I was at the, Panera Bread standoff in Princeton, where the guy was actually shot dead uh, in Panera Bread uh, on Nassau Street. I guess, yeah, that's the main street in Princeton. And that was another one where it was kind of like, you know, you're standing like right next to the restaurant, like I could look at it. You don't know, you see these guys walking in with like these SWAT weapons, you don't really know where the crossfire is going to be. But obviously, you know, nothing bad usually happens. You might hear stories, but they're like definitely like in the minority. People go out to like much crazier things. You know, you have people covering crazy things like in Europe and like in these wars and stuff, and they come back and tell stories about it. Yeah, uh, but it does speak to the mission of a journalist. You really got to believe in what you're doing um, yeah, and that seriously. it's important because otherwise, you know, is, is it worth putting your life online sometimes? And I think it, as a journalist, you almost always are going to have moments like that. Even if you don't go to war, uh, you know, we live in a dangerous place right now. and. Uh, in certainly in New York City, in you know, parts of New Jersey, uh, not that far away from where we are right now, there, there's those issues. Uh, let's see again what other questions we've got here. So we have Caroline Pierce, who's another one of our SBJ members. What do you think is the most important skill to possess as a journalist? Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, I would say uh, charisma is like really important. You have to be pretty outgoing and just willing to, you know, go out of your way to go talk to some random person you'll never meet, you don't know how they're going to respond to you. Uh, you do that a lot. You know, you also have to be pretty savvy with, nowadays, with data and, uh, you know, records requests, at least in my line of work. But mm -hmm. I really, people who cover sports and uh, education or business, they're going to be submitting Oprah's and record requests too for like school board stuff or like, uh, you know, sports funding, stuff like that. That's all data that can be requested. Uh, so those two things are really important, I think. Definitely, uh, being outgoing and uh, being able to like navigate public documents. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's put a few more up here. Uh, we have Andrea Cabrera, who's one of our graduate students. Have you ever faced inside censoring by your editors to protect certain interests while working on a story? An editor maybe, or was there ever an issue? I know I've had some situations at the Daily News where there was an advertiser involved in a story trying to kill it because they didn't like the direction of the coverage, or... What we'll happened with that one? Uh, well, there were situations where usually with the advertisers, it was more we would cover things only because there was an advertiser involved. For example, one of the big advertisers of the Daily News was PC Richard and Son, um, and I guess still to this day. 
And there would be like, one time there's just like this very comical, like we ran this big like half page photograph of the grand opening of a PC Richard and Son electronic store. And there was like no one even there in the photograph. It was just like, it was really sad. It made it look like a terrible yeah, like place to go shopping. Yeah. Um, but yet we you know, ran it with this like big caption and it, like pretty early in the paper. And it just was like, we would not be there if they weren't, you know, putting all this money. And Macy's was another one of our big advertisers. And so we would joke sometimes in the office about like, you know, no matter what terrible thing happened at Macy's or PC Richard or Models or these other chains that advertise us all the time, we would not be covering it. Yeah, that's like the big secret with journalism. It's kind of like, we like to think people are buying newspapers to read our stories. But really, newspapers were bought for advertisements, you know, mm -hmm. and that's why newspapers are going out of business because people aren't buying newspapers for advertisements. They're going to Craigslist and they're going online. And that's just like the reality of the thing. Um, so yeah, there's definitely like the advertiser influence. I don't see it so much on like my level. Um, I think that's everywhere though. You know, it's kind of like this dirty secret of journalism. You know, we get paid advertisements, but it's like nobody really cares besides journalists and uh, like journalism professors. It's funny. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, no, I can't really think of anything uh, where my editor was like, you're definitely not going to do this because you're jeopardizing so-and-so and, -so and that's going to affect us like this and that. Uh, it doesn't really happen on my level so much. Um, it's usually all pretty fair game. Uh, we definitely have standards that some papers don't, like we won't publish the name of a minor, even if we know their name, some papers will. We don't do that. Uh, we don't go like, like I wouldn't put something so egregious like in the headline like the New York Post would. We don't publish people's like home address typically. Um, mm -hmm. We have like our own kind of like standard, even like without, a, with, we're a part of a big chain of newspapers, but you know, individually we have like things that we've been doing <coughs> ourselves just because our audience is unique. Every market's different. And uh, our market tends to be like a lot of college educated people, um, a lot of like pharmaceutical professionals, uh, just like a lot of upper middle class people. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, it's a really interesting market actually. It was kind of like this funny decision. I don't know who really merged the two papers together, but Courier News has always had like a prim primarily conservative audience and Home News Tribune since it covers Middlesex obviously had like a majority Democrat audience and then they merged these two things together and they're like, here, take it, it's the same thing. It's kind of like, no, but I guess it makes for fair coverage, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has some balance in the reporting for sure. Um, all right, let's see what else we've got up there. Juliet Ruiz, who is our SBJ secretary, is it hard to remain impartial in today's political climate? We were just talking about covering President Trump and, you know, one day you see him on TV saying journalists are the enemy, the next day you're like, hi, President Trump, I'm here to ask you a question. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that's just one example I can think of immediately, but has that been difficult for you? Yeah, what's going on with that stuff is just absolutely terrible. It really is. Um, for me, uh, no, I kind of just like take a step back and laugh at it in a way. You know, I'm more of a cynic. I'm not really a political guy. Uh, I think, you know, I've seen politicians on both sides of the aisle get convicted and go to jail. So it's kind of like I'm a registered independent. Mm -hmm. you know, I do that just because I write stories about politicians. I know a lot of journalists who aren't, uh, but I don't really know anybody that like wears it on their sleeve so much. You know what I mean? Right. At least not in my paper. We're, a community, we're like a local paper. You know, it doesn't maybe at like a bigger chain of newspapers like New York Times or Washington Post. You kind of see like that slant. But, you know, we don't have the money for that. We got to make people, you know, we got to want people to read us. So you have to write stories about both things, you know. Right. And for me, that's really not that difficult. Um, yeah. I, I definitely vote on both sides of the ballot. Something that, uh, you know, we'll get back to Twitter questions for a second, but I want to talk to you about that you just remind me of social media because a lot of students have social media accounts and they're probably espousing those kinds of views, getting them out there on social media saying, you know, I'm voting for this candidate or I dislike this candidate or whatever. Um, and that can be found, of course, later on by somebody who wants to accuse you of unfair coverage and say like, oh, you know, Nick, you yeah. just tweeted this thing saying you didn't like the mayor of this town, like maybe been five years ago, maybe when you were in high school or something like that. And yet it can live forever. Yeah. Um, so are you careful? Because we haven't talked much about, I know you're active on Twitter, you have an Instagram. Do you make sure that you're doing or not doing certain things on those accounts? Yeah, it's funny. You guys hit me up. SPJ like tagged me a lot on Instagram. I have a private Instagram. Mm -hmm. I do have like my work URL in there, but I skateboard, so it's like a lot of like skateboarding stuff, and it's not really like a lot with journalism. Sometimes I'll take like a picture of the front page and whatnot, but it is private because I don't like you know like sources and people going on my Instagram. Mm -hmm. Not that I would mind. Like you could follow me, I'll follow back. Yada yada yada. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, definitely be careful what you put on social media um, because that stuff does. People can search for it. They'll find it. There's websites that take screenshots of that stuff so it's saved like even if you delete it um 
But yeah, like I was saying before, like being a registered independent is great because I can like kind of like nitpick. Like if somebody tries to like argue, you know, you did this, that's so democratic. It's like, no, I don't because I don't like that about Democrats or this about Republicans. And mm -hmm. it kind of just gives me like this unique stance to like kind of criticize both sides. Yeah, I've heard uh, when I was a reporter from some journals who refused to even vote in an election because they thought that that was going too far overboard into Yeah, that's a lot. Now, I think that's a little bit But much. I like, won't eat at like events. Like I won't go to like an event. Like I, this, I, if there was food, I'd probably eat at it because I'm not covering it. But if I'm covering something, like it's just like this old habit that kind of spilled over from like the state house when I was up in New York. You don't want to like eat in front of a politician because like what if someday they're like, yeah, hey, how was that free lunch, by the way? You know, because there's no such thing as a free lunch. Right. Yeah, so accepting gifts, and it may seem minor to you at the time, right? Oh, I just accepted they had a cookie at yeah, a function. We don't, like, or, we don't even, like when they come in the office, we usually donate them. Like people right. will send us stuff like, thank you for writing about us. Like here's a free thing of cookies or like a free coat or whatever. And I'll just like drop, like I got a bunch of shampoo products for something or other. I don't even know what it was for. That's I a got random a one. Yeah, but I like dropped it off like the homeless shelters. Like mm. I don't need this and I'm not taking it. Right, right. Very good point. All right, let's get back to some of the things that uh, people want to ask you here. John Fiorino, oh my God, it's so weird to see myself up there. Uh, John Fiorino, who's the vice president of our SBJ chapter, saying, what are you doing this time tomorrow night? Nothing. Oh, this is when he was just, sorry, this is his ad for this event. Sorry, it ended up on here, John. No, he, uh, he had another question, though. Yeah, but he does have another question up there. Would you like to remain in the section of journalism that you're in now, or would you like to move to a different department, such as sports or entertainment news? No, I like, uh, I like hard news a lot. Um, I liked, when I was in college, I liked features, I liked investigative stuff. And it's kind of neat because I'm doing both of that here. Um, I don't know if I'd always be an investigative reporter. Uh, it is a lot of work. You make a lot of people mad at you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it does feel pretty crappy when somebody loses their job, believe it or not. Uh, you know, they have kids, they have a family, but you know, it's your job to write about it. It's your job to catch them in the act, kind of, you know, for lack of a better term. Um, but I love what I'm doing now, you know, despite that. Um, and if there was another opportunity later on, I would probably pursue that again, uh, and I definitely would stay like in the hard news side of my newsroom or any other mm -hmm. newsroom. Well, and just to start closing out our conversation, one of the things I know that uh, we talked about before and is on the mind of anyone who's in journalism today is the future of the industry. Uh, you're seeing the headlines everywhere. I'm sure it's not just you know mycentraljersey.com, but uh, every journalist is worried about being laid off, buyouts. Um, how do you kind of tackle that kind of news when you, you, know, you see maybe colleagues on the way out, people who've worked at the same paper for decades and now they're kind of having an unceremonious end, they're being kicked out the door. Uh, you're a young guy who's just starting out in this industry just like a lot of these students are. So how do you take that or what's your view on the industry? Yeah, it is, uh, you know, it happens everywhere, unfortunately. Uh, and I've seen it happen a few times at my paper. You know, I'd come in, see somebody get laid off like in the morning and then you kind of go on with the rest of the day and it's really disheartening. It's kind of like, how do you expect this to work in this environment if you're going to like lay somebody off mm -hmm. in front of us like on a Tuesday, you know? And it's like the whole rest of the week is kind of sour after that. And it's sad, but you know, that's just like it's the way the cookie crumbles, you know? Right. People who are in journalism kind of like know that that's going to happen, especially these days. Uh, and if you made it this far, you know, you consider yourself lucky and you kind of count your blessings. Uh, I'm young, so I don't, I'm out of college. I don't get paid as much as some of the other people. So I always just kind of like rationalize it with like, I'm probably not gonna be the one on the chopping block. I produce a lot of content, uh, I'm really quick and effective. And that kind of thing like really shows, uh, you know, if you can do like a video or if, if you can shoot your own photos. Like we don't have any photographers anymore. When I started, we had photographers. Mm -hmm. They're not, we don't have full-time photographers. We handle, we like rely on freelancers. And it's just because, you know, a lot of papers don't have photographers these days. And it's sad, but true. That's really not even like a, professional a lot of people even pursue these days mm -hmm. um, but I have like my own camera so I'll like bring it out take my own photos upload them and just you know kind of go like one step above what's expected of you kind of mm -hmm. you know what I mean so like I was in college busting my butt I'm still kind of doing that here right. sometimes you know you slam your fist on your desk and you're mad because you get all the stuff assigned to you but you know you're going to accomplish it and then it looks better in the end yeah, so again, to kind of close it out, um, since you are the reigning rookie reporter of the year from New Jersey Society of Professional Journalists, uh, a rising star in our industry, and someone, you know, we see so many of our reality check guests who have had a lot of experience, and uh, they can talk about that, but you can talk about, you know, this future. So since you're speaking to your brethren here, uh, people who are in that similar age group, uh, why do you think it makes sense to still go into journalism amid all of those sorts of challenges? What still inspires you, excites you about this field? Yeah, um, 
because you're probably needed more now than ever before in my lifetime and probably your lifetime, I'd say. Um, it's at like this really interesting time in global politics where you're starting to see this shift in not just in America, but everywhere in the whole world, like this kind of like tilt back to the right and kind of like empowerment to say, you know, whatever you want or do whatever you want kind of mentality. And uh, the only people that are really watching them, despite what any politician is going to tell you, is really the press, you know, whether it's leaning Democratic or leaning Republican or whatever. They're there to, you know, report and tell you what's happened. And uh, that's an important thing. You know, people take it for granted now. Uh, if there was a state-run television network, you'd just be fed the same BS, like, constantly, all the time. You know, look at North Korea, look at China. Uh, you know, you got people dying to get out of there to come to America for the freedoms we have. And one of the most important ones is freedom of press. And, uh, you know, sometimes it is kind of disheartening, but when it clicks and when it works, you know, it really does feel good and you kind of take solace in that fact. Um, and that's really what we're doing it for, uh, to change people's lives and to shine a light on something that probably wouldn't have been shown any other way. Yeah, well, Nick, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Um, just before you go, uh, want to remind you all, this is our last reality check of the fall semester. We're going to be back in the spring with more guests. I've been negotiating with various people, so I can't announce exactly who it's going to be, but we will have a full slate, I guarantee it, uh, for the spring. And uh, just want to we'll make a final presentation to Nick. Um, and thank you again for, for coming out to William Patterson. You should bring that guy in that just wrote the Islanders book. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. I just had a book that came out, so appreciate that. Thank you so much for coming.